Tonight's webinar is a joint presentation by Miller Thompson and Hub Insurance. Miller Thompson is one of Canada's most respected law firms with close to 550 professionals practicing in 12 offices across the country, including Toronto, Markham, Vaughan, Kitchener-Waterloo, Guelph, London, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Regina, and Montreal. We go beyond a strict technical analysis of the law. In providing advice, we take a practical approach that combines legal knowledge and analysis with risk management, quality of care, and resource considerations. Our team-based practice ensures that issues are addressed at the appropriate stage and form part of our risk-managed approach to legal services. Miller Thompson's industry, Health Industry Group is one of the firm's key industry-focused teams. We have a consistent track record in providing practical, creative, and cost-effective advice, combined with an unyielding service commitment to our clients and the communities in which we practice. Hub is a global brokerage that puts our clients at the center of everything we do. Our research and resources mean our clients have the insurance they need when they need it and before they know they need it. Hub provides complete protection, property, casualty, life and health insurance products, employee benefits and risk, business risk management, as well as wealth management products and services. Working with Hub means working with a team of experts dedicated to helping clients understand their risks and manage all of their insurance requirements. A national brokerage that delivers like a local agency. Our local hub offers personal service, individual attention, and has the ability to respond quickly to clients' needs and regional market changes. Collectively, the hubs are a knowledge powerhouse providing specific solutions that are designed to draw upon our combined skills and expertise. In Ontario, we have more than 1,100 employees in 27 offices. So our speakers tonight are Catherine Frelick of Miller Thompson and Kim Stewart of Hub Insurance. Catherine Frelick leads Miller Thompson's National Health Industry Group and is a partner in its Toronto office. Catherine has specialized expertise in health and privacy law and is a leading lawyer in these areas. She advises health industry clients on a broad range of matters with a particular focus on regulatory, strategic, and risk management advice, as well as advocacy before health and privacy administrative tribunals and regulatory bodies. Catherine writes and speaks frequently on health and privacy related topics. Kim Stewart has been with Hub for over 18 years with a focus on programs and association business alongside other areas of risk management. She heads up Hub HKMB's Programs Unit, which services a number of healthcare-based programs, tailoring coverage to meet the specific needs of those professionals. Of late, Kim has been working with cyber insurance markets to provide a comprehensive competitive offering for privacy breach exposures to those in the healthcare space. Kim is a self-confessed insurance nerd, and her greatest passion is helping her clients to understand their exposures and helping to guide them in their risk management decisions. Welcome, Catherine and Kim. Thank you very much. We uh, are delighted to be here this evening. Um, and uh, to give you a bit of a roadmap, um, we're going to start with a, a, a quick overview of the application of the Personal Health Information Protection Act to optometrists. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what exactly privacy and cyber risk is, um, as well as whether you can sue um, for privacy or cyber breach. Um, I'll give you a hint, the answer is yes. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about uh, managing privacy risk and cyber risk, which will lead uh, very nicely into Kim's presentation uh, around uh, cyber insurance and um, uh, how to uh, protect uh, your practices. So without further ado, um, the Personal Health Information Protection Act has been in, um, in, in play um, since uh, 2004, um, and it provides a um, a comprehensive set of rules for the collection, use, and disclosure of personal health information um, about individuals 
um, that protects the confidentiality of that information and the privacy, but importantly, also facilitates the effective provision of health care. And uh, it does that in a number of ways, um, in, including the ability to rely on implied consent uh, when um, providing um, sharing information um, for various purposes. Um, the Act applies to health information custodians, or HICS, um, who are persons or organizations that have custody or control of personal health information um, in connection with their uh, powers and duties, which is essentially providing health care. Um, for optometrists, um, there are usually several uh, different um, uh, categories in which uh, optometrists fall. Um, either as a health professional um, or as a person who operates a group practice of healthcare professionals. Um, and depending on um, how you're organized, um, that makes, um, uh, that's very important because most of the responsibilities under the legislation um, really fall on the health information custodian. Um, so in this next slide, I've set out some of the different uh, combinations and permutations that we see. Um, if you're an independent contractor or have a, a, uh, your own practice, then um, uh, obviously you would be um, the health information custodian. Um, if you um, have associate optometrists who are working with you, um, typically they would be acting as your agents and uh, the optometrist who um, owns the practice would be the health information custodian. Um, we see interesting um, situations where optometrists are practicing with um, other health pra uh, care practitioners, um, particularly with um, um, opticians and, um, and sharing a practice, in which case um, there are requirements under uh, your legislation uh, to do so as an independent contractor and to maintain your status as a health information custodian so that you are responsible for your records of uh, personal health information relating to your, your patients. Um, there's also a requirement for you to have a written agreement um, with um, that uh, optical store or corporation um, setting that out um, and, and what you're um, uh, ensuring that you're able to um, assert your authority over your records. Um, regardless of who uh, the health information custodian is, um, it's important that you ensure that you always have a right of access to your records um, if necessary in order to fulfill your professional obligations. So that means after you've left a practice, um, if there's a need for you to um, um, have access to information of your clients in order to um, address an issue with your, with your college or uh, deal with a complaint, um, ensuring that you have that ability to access that information. I have set out um, some of the uh, provisions that uh, guide record keeping um, under the Optometry Act uh, and regulation, as well as um, some of the uh, college's policies um, that set out what your obligations are. The important thing um, for our purposes today is it's not always clear under PFF um, who the health information custodian is. And because of that, it's very, very important to ensure um, that you have established that um, through contractual arrangements with um, other partners, um, if you're practicing um, in tandem, um, to ensure that you know that you've uh, dealt with issues around ownership, maintenance, and transfer of records, particularly if there's a change in practice or a, a practice relocation. And I can tell you that we get uh, numerous calls um, from individuals um, who uh, are changing their practice and they don't know whether or not they can take their records with them. Um, if they're on an electronic um, health record system, 
sometimes uh, the, the electronic record system will be owned by someone else. Uh, there may be a cost in order to um, uh, take those records with you. And so having those um, uh, issues dealt with ahead of time um, and put to paper is, is really important um, so that you're not dealing with a situation where um, you don't have access to the records of your own patients. We're going to start with a polling question. We're going to start with polling question number one. And this is a fairly straightforward one. The question is, do you know who the health information custodian is for your patient records? The answers here are yes, no, or not sure. <laughs> All right, so our answers uh, have come in, and 86% um, of the uh, individuals have who took the poll said yes, they know. Um, 1% says no, and 13% says they're not sure. Um, and uh, we're going to go to a second polling question, which ties into this one as well. And that will be posted in a second. And this question is, if you have a business arrangement, do you have a written agreement addressing patient records? All right, so about half of the respondents um, have a, a, this, have a, a written agreement dealing with patient records, which is great. 30% um, have said no, and 20% uh, have said that it's not applicable to them. So um, I'm glad to see that uh, so many of you do have an agreement in place, and um, for those who don't, that's a, a good takeaway to take um, um, back with you after this session. Um, so what are the obligations of a health information custodian? Um, they have to comply with the act. Um, they're required to have policies and procedures in place that deal with um, how, when, and the purpose for which um, personal health information is collected, used, and disclosed, or uh, retained or destroyed. Um, and uh, there's a need to have um, safeguards in place to ensure that you are protecting that personal health information. Um, the Act requires that you take reasonable steps, and reasonable steps isn't something that's defined, um, but it's something that is um, developed through uh, guidance from the Information Privacy Commissioner and from other sources um, to uh, protect against theft, loss, and unauthorized use or disclosure unauthorized copying, modification, or disposal. One of the significant requirements under uh, PHIPAA, and which uh, will come into uh, the uh, um, subject to much of our discussion today, um, is the requirement to notify the patient or their substitute decision maker um, uh, the first reasonable opportunity if personal health information has been stolen or lost or if it is uh, used or disclosed without authority. Um, the uh, legislation was actually changed uh, a couple of years ago uh, to make um, this, uh, this section more encompassing. Um, so it really does cover off um, almost everything um, uh, that you can think of. Um, and it's something that's not discretionary. So if um, if that um, if if the personal health information is has been stolen or lost, or um, if you determine that uh, there's been a breach, 
you have an obligation to notify. Um, and you also need to tell them that they have the ability um, to make a complaint to the Information and Privacy Commissioner. Um, in addition, um, there are now mandatory uh, obligations to notify the Information and Privacy Commissioner um, in uh, certain circumstances. Um, including where there's been a significant breach or there's been a pattern of behavior um, and uh, in most, uh, or if there's a situation where one of your agents, whether it's a, a support staff or a, um, an associate um, has been involved in a privacy breach. I won't go into the other obligations um, in uh, detail other than to say that you have to have a contact person um, and there's a requirement to have a written statement setting out uh, your, what your practices are um, and how to make uh, a complaint from the, among other things. We're going to talk now about some of the privacy and cyber risk trends that we are seeing. Um, one of those is uh, increasing concern around the risk of identity theft. Um, by taking uh, certain information in combination, um, there is a, a, an ability for someone um, to uh, use that information um, to uh, gain access to, um, to individuals' um, finances um, or to uh, take other steps um, to that are um, uh, around their um, financial and other needs. Um, typically, if there's a concern about identity theft, um, one of the issue, one of the remedies that we use is credit monitoring, um, and there may be a need to uh, change um, uh, or cancel your um, identification and uh, to purchase others. Um, reputational risk is a very big. Um, concern. Um, issues around privacy and cyber breach are very, very um, prominent in the media. Um, it is uh, something that it affects your business um, in all ways. And um, that's really one of the predominant risks um, that we have seen, um, especially because there's greater public awareness. Um, and there is also um, the development of new privacy torts in Canada, um, which allow people to sue for privacy breach. Um, finally, we are seeing a significant increase in cyber attacks aimed at um, health practices. In fact, um, estimates are that um, approximately 41% of um, attacks in the year uh, 2018 uh, we're targeted to the health sector. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, when we're talking about privacy and cyber risk, we're really talking about um, the risk of financial loss, disruption, um, stakeholder dissatisfaction. So uh, in the legal consequences or damages to the reputation of an organization, um, either relating to the collection, use and disclosure of personal health information, which is our privacy risk, or um, some failure of your information technology systems, um, which is the cyber component. Uh, a cyber threat may involve personal health information and trigger um, privacy obligations. I've set out a number of examples of different types of privacy breaches. Um, the unauthorized collection of personal health information um, in this uh, uh, media savvy world, um, it, you know, can include things like um, capturing information with camera phones or personal devices. Unauthorized disclosure of personal health information could be through a lost or stolen laptop. Um, if you don't properly de uh, destroy uh, public uh, personal health information, um, and uh, Facebook and social media. Um, is, is an area where we've seen um, a great deal of um, uh, unauthorized or unintended um, disclosure of personal health information. Um, 
unintended use of personal health information, we often think about the snooping cases where someone is um, going into someone's records without having um, authorization to do so. I've set out a number of different types of cyber breaches. Um, uh, I'm sure you are all familiar with the Nigerian prince um, emails who were trying to get you to um, be soft hearted and, and provide money so that they can um, help their sick uh, daughter. Or the, um, but, you know, we, we see more and more of the phishing emails where people are trying to get someone to press the button or take an action um, so that your, um, uh, so that they can access your computer with malware. So oh, we're going to go to the third mm -hmm. polling question. Uh, my practice has experienced one or more of the following. Uh, choose all that apply. Um, a, a significant privacy breach. B, a minor privacy breach. C, a significant cyber incident. Um, or D, a minor cyber incident. When we're talking about minor um, privacy breach or minor cyber incident, we're really talking about those situations that are um, probably unintended, um, like a misdirected fax or email um, versus something that's more significant um, that has a broader implication. All right, well, I'm glad that there are not a lot of significant breaches um, that have been identified. Um, you know, 1% uh, of our respondents who have um, said that they've had a significant privacy or cyber incident. Um, but uh, the minor privacy breaches and cyber incidents are um, roughly a quarter of respondents. So um, it is something that is definitely very prevalent. We're going to talk a little bit about a, um, a particular situation of ransomware. Um, this is the Erie County Medical Center. Um, and uh, the handout um, that, that uh, we have actually relates to that same situation. Um, this is fairly um, uh, typical of what we see. Um, in this case, it was a brute force attack where hackers used uh, many different combinations of passwords in order to identify weak passwords and gain access to the system. Um, it's, often it's through a, it could be through an administrator's password, it could be through a, a laptop, um, but essentially what they did is they encrypted um, the files um, and demanded uh, $44,000 in ransom in order to decrypt um, the information. Um, more than 6,000 computers were affected. And in the end, uh, they didn't pay the ransom, which is actually recommended. Um, even if you do pay the ransom, it's not guaranteed that you're going to get your information back. Um, and uh, in this case, the hospital had access to regional electronic records. Um, so they were uh, personal health information, the patient records, they were able to access, access it through other means. Um, the hospital spent $5 million on uh, new hardware, software, um, and uh, data recovery um, services, as well as uh, a huge amount of time and loss, a loss in uh, overtime and loss of business. Um, so, um, you know, these types of situations can have a, a devastating effect, um, not only um, because essentially you have to rebuild uh, your systems. Um, this is also happening uh, in Canada. I have um, three situations in, um, uh, in October and December of 2019 um, relating to um, hospitals being um, hit by uh, ransomware. Um, 
Uh, interestingly, with uh, the changes in the um, health system and the move to Ontario health teams, um, there are claims that uh, the, the, pro the focus on uh, moving to digital um, um, sharing of personal health information has actually led to an increase in cyber attacks. Um, and then the Life Labs situation, um, which uh, affected millions of uh, people's uh, personal health information, was also in the, um, in the news. Um, it's gotten to the point where um, the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity has um, issued um, countrywide alerts um, for certain types of ransomware, um, uh, which they did in, in October of this past year. Uh, so why the health sector? There's a number of, of reasons for that. Um, personal health information is value, valuable. It's something that, um, uh, it's not like a credit card where you can cancel it and then it no longer has any value. It, it has something that has um, a sustainable value. Um, healthcare, uh, we tend to be slow to react. Um, there's a wealth of information and it's essential information. Um, and uh, vulnerable to human error. Um, finally, there's a, a wide range of communication technologies. Um, if you think back to the ransomware situation, consider that um, it, uh, your system um, is connected to, uh, may be connected to your printers, it may be connected to your phones, um, it may be connected to um, anything that is really tied to that system. So if there's something um, that's infected, um, it may impact on all of your systems. Okay. Right. We'll talk a little bit now uh, and not spend a lot of time on it on uh, whether you can be uh, sued for privacy breach. Um, this is a fairly new development in Canadian law. Um, in the past, there was traditionally no um, independent ability to uh, sue for um, breach of privacy, um, but the landscape has, has certainly changed. Um, and we've also seen an increase in privacy and cyber class actions in Canada. Um, think about the, the rogue employee um, who steals personal health information and provides it to a um, provider of um, RESPs for uh, maternal uh, patients, um, or um, definitely the unauthorized access um, the snooping cases, which we see across the country. Uh, the emerging privacy courts include um, three uh, new um, courts that have been recognized uh, by the courts, um, one being intrusion upon seclusion, public disclosure of private facts. And then just in December, um, the courts recognized a new uh, privacy action, which uh, they call publicly placing a person in false light. Um, the damages for these uh, types of um, torts may be limited um, to under uh, $20,000 for um, intrusion upon seclusion. But if you have a large number of individuals who've been affected, uh, it can be um, grow to be a very large number um, uh, in terms of uh, potential exposure. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the new privacy tort, which uh, from December um, 2019. Um, and this involved a situation where a um, a father was um, posting um, videos and uh, uh, information about his children and his wife, um, and uh, essentially was cyberbullying them in the middle of a custody dispute. Um, and it was so bad that he, uh, there were a num number of court orders um, that um, required him to stop and to take this information off of the, um, uh, uh, the uh, internet. Um, and it got to the point where um, it was so offensive to the courts that they created a new 
um, privacy tort um, for uh, the life of this um, individual, where it was so highly offensive. Um, and they knew that what they were doing was false and put the person in a false light um, that they needed to create a, a remedy for this person. So what are the implications? Well, this, the stakes for optometrists um, who are involved in a privacy breach are high. They could be subject to um, not only claims, but also privacy complaints. Um, there are um, offenses under the Personal Health Information Protection Act, um, professional disciplinary proceedings, um, and then again, loss of employment or loss of reputation. Um, prevention is the best strategy. There are a number of uh, different measures that um, are set out on um, the screen, including the development of um, policies and procedures. Um, and it's not enough to just have those policies. You need to make, make sure that you're monitoring and auditing um, compliance with those policies, whether it's uh, through random audits or um, different security checks um, to make sure that um, they're actually intact. Um, think again um, of uh, evolving uh, privacy and security standards that may change over time. Um, the use of facts has been, in the past, was a very common um, way of transmitting personal health information and was thought to be um, uh, more secure than use of email. Um, but with strong encryption, um, it's now, um, you know, with, with those types of measures in place, it's far more secure than facts. Um, Above all, um, training and education is uh, key um, and uh, ensuring that individuals um, know uh, what their um, obligations are uh, is, uh, I can't stress that enough, um, because it's really more about people than it is technology. And um, that's where um, often systems fall down. Uh, there are different strategies that you can use uh, for managing risk, and um, Kim is going to be talking about some of those. Um, uh, the, um, I've said it, um, you know, different options that you can look at to avoid or remove the risk, um, to share or transfer the risk, um, or in some circumstances, um, you can uh, decide to retain the risk um, uh, um, and then have measures in place to try to minimize um, any of the, the risks associated with that. So um, at a minimum, um, when breaches happen, they happen quickly. And um, our best advice is to make sure that you have a privacy breach protocol, um, which addresses containment of the breach, notification, of individuals' investigation and remediation. And there's some good guidelines that the information privacy commissioners put out um, and have a cyber incident plan. Um, when you need to contact those experts, it's very um, difficult to do that on the fly. And um, there are uh, people who are very skilled at dealing with privacy breaches. Uh, we have one more polling question from our session. Mm -hmm. um, and this question is, my practice has the privacy breach protocol and cyber incident plan. Choose all that apply. Uh, so A is uh, privacy breach only. B is cyber incident only. C is privacy breach and cyber incident. Um, D is neither and E is not sure. All right. Well, those are uh, lower numbers uh, for these questions, um, which is not um, all that surprising, um, but um, is something to to definitely think about, um, even if it's uh, you know reference to uh, guidelines that are already um, 
established, um, knowing where to go when something happens is, is really important. Because um, responding to cyber and uh, privacy breaches is very, can be very uh, costly and time consuming. Um, ensure that you uh, engage with uh, experienced legal counsel early on, and I'm not just saying this to plug uh, Miller Thompson, uh, but uh, it's important to establish legal privilege over your investigation um, to make sure that you are um, protecting um, any of the documents that are being created so that you um, are not putting yourself at risk of um, in, in the face of a, a lawsuit or uh, another um, issue. Um, and um, make sure that you are um, have a strong communication strategy in place um, and uh, including how you notify individuals um, and uh, how you address um, issues if people have questions. So with that, um, my last slide is uh, consider risk transfer um, and specialized insurance. Um, and uh, some programs do have access to legal and other experts that have experience managing situations um, and privacy breach coaches, which um, is, is something that, um, that I do a lot of and which is really valuable. And I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Well, um, good evening, everyone. Um, as uh, Catherine said, my name is Kim Stewart, uh, and I would just like to put a quick shout out to say thank you to everybody who's attending this presentation and spending some time this evening learning about cyber and, and risk management. Um, Catherine's presentation uh, so far has been extremely interesting, um, and I've just learned a few things. So I hope everybody on the line has also been able to, to pick up on, on a few tidbits. Um, I uh, have the privilege of working with the Ontario Association of Optometrists, um, and Hub is the insurance broker for the OAO. We uh, sincerely appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and to act on your behalf in various areas of coverage, including professional liability, uh, cyber risk, and uh, your clinic insurance. So there's my plug for Hub. Um, so one of the things I wanted to first of all chat about was um, our overall agenda today is more of a who, a why, a what, and a how. It's a really nice way for everybody to just kind of dial down a little bit more into the insurance aspect of this. Now that we've kind of worked with Catherine to see what your overall exposures are and your responsibilities are as an OD operating in Ontario from a privacy breach perspective. However, our first poll question that's going to be coming up is due to the fact that I have a lot of people telling me that they don't have online storage. Everything is on paper. So I'd like to ask everybody on the line right now to say, have you moved to the online storage of patient data? Yes, no, or are you considering the move? So we can see here that we've got well over half the participants so far have moved to online storage. There's still 33 or still almost half that either have not or are considering a move to it. Um, the reason I brought that up today is because you could have a privacy breach and have insurance cover that privacy breach even if you don't have online storage records. If anybody were to take your own records, you would actually have a cyber concern. So it does affect everybody that will be on the line today. We're moving into the who now, and really who are the parties involved in the privacy of patient records? Obviously you have the patient. The patient has the right to expect that their records will be kept safe and private. You have the OD. You're the responsibility of the records are the responsibility of the individual doctors, and Catherine did a very, very good job at going through and explaining what those responsibilities are. And then you have your EMR, your electronic medical record systems. These are while the EMR might be hosting the data, 
they do not have a specific duty of care to the doctor's patients. The health information custodian remains as the doctor or the OD in our specific case. So it's key to remember that you remain, that you, you as an OD retain that responsibility. So we go into the why, and I must admit, after listening to Catherine's presentation, the why has become implicitly clear. We do know that, as Catherine said, we've seen significant amounts of breaches within the healthcare industry. Our healthcare programs within Hub have seen multiple cyber breaches across the board. This is from, ranging from everywhere, from physiotherapists, medical doctors, dentists, um, the, the, uh, the, the threat actors, the bad actors, which is the fancy term for hackers these days, uh, do not discriminate. What we have seen though, is all our first party costs, the third party or people making a claim against you or taking a suit against you, or Catherine did show us that they are able to in the law, we have seen very, very few to no cases of actual suits being put against, at least from our experience and where cyber policies have responded to. We can also let you know that the majority of cyber breaches that we have seen in Canada are ransomware attacks, people shutting down your system and demanding a ransom. So now we're going to move into poll question six. And I'm going to ask you, are you familiar with what a cyber incident could include? If you were paying attention to Catherine's presentation, you probably were the answer. So we can see here that we have 64% of people are saying yes, they are familiar, and we have 34% of people online who have said no. So what I'd love to do is I'd love to go forward and let you know a little bit more about what you could see from a privacy breach perspective. It is an improper, an unauthorization collection, use, disclosure, retention, or disposable, disposal of personal information. So it can include many, many things. A malware attack where it just installs a virus and shuts down your system. They're not asking for ransomware, they're just being pests. You have business email compromise where people are have logged into your system and are watching your emails and then are sending you an email that's almost exactly like you would expect to hear from somebody and gaining access that way. There's ransomware, as we heard from um, medical clinic that um, Catherine had outlined where they, medical data was being locked out until ransom was paid. And then there's, Phishing, not the fun kind of phishing, but the nasty kind of phishing, where it is fraudulent attempt to obtain sensitive information by disguising oneself as a trustworthy entity. Um, this is where you may have had an email from a vendor saying um, our, our mail, our data entry uh, has changed, or our, our uh, way that we're collecting our money has changed, our bank account information has changed. Um, and so we're moving on now into um, my last poll question which does take us into, have you experienced or heard other clinics having a cyber incident, a ransomware attack, a phishing incident? So we're seeing here the majority of people uh, uh, responding online have said that um, they have not heard of somebody you know, having that type of exposure. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, the uh, overall exposure that we have seen um, can, uh, can, can be both sides. We can hear that like, certain people have had a lot, people have not had it. So um, I'm happy to hear that because it means perhaps that um, this group isn't uh, as being as, as, as targeted. So moving into the actual exposures, the regulatory exposures, Catherine did a very good job outlining. My thought process here is I'd like to note some of the operational exposures that a clinic can face when they have a cyber uh, attack or a privacy breach. You could face out-of-pocket costs. If you have a cyber breach, you would want to hire a breach consultant you would want to hire public relations, perhaps. Uh, you would want to pay for those legal fees. 
You may have fines and penalties imposed against you. You may have ransom payments imposed against you. You could also have a uh, business interruption loss because you cannot operate your facility, so you have loss of profits. You may have loss of data and be forced to do some data reconstruction. We have some liability claims. As we said, we haven't seen too many of them here in Canada, but obviously, as noted in Catherine's presentation, the exposure is definitely there. And then finally, you have loss of reputations. Uh, we did, Catherine did touch on that briefly in the fact that um, people and, and patients expect to have their data secure, and perhaps they would consider a move to a different operation in a different clinic if they felt that their information was not secure there. So now I'm going to move into what is cyber insurance, which I get a lot of questions on. What exactly is this and how does it protect me? Quite often we also get, I have insurance. It's going to protect me already. I don't need to buy a standalone cyber coverage because I already have it included somewhere. I have liability coverage. So if somebody puts a claim against me, my professional liability or my general liability is going to protect me. There are exclusions in both standard general liability and professional liability programs, including the one that the um, OAO has, if you do not have a cyber extension on it, um, that, that will say that certain things will not provide coverage for. Uh, business interruption, they'll say, well, our clinic has business interruption coverage, so we have coverage there. It will not cover a cyber attack. Or crime coverage. If you're facing a phishing or a, or a cyber exposure, um, I, I have crime coverage under my office package, so I've got coverage. It would also not, usually would not respond. And then directors and officers liability, more and more of those types of standalone policies, if you do have them, are adding on cyber exclusions. There are also pros and cons of adding on a cyber coverage to a traditional insurance policy. And here I am speaking more of a clinic office package that's adding on cyber versus a dedicated cyber extension that's written and included as part of something. So um, oh, I'm going to touch very briefly on the liability type of insurance coverage that a policy would respond to. It would respond to privacy liability, which is people putting a claim against you because their privacy was breached. There's network security liability. If you, as an OD clinic, are connected, let's say, to a hospital, and through a, a hack in your facility, they have also realized how they can log into a hospital's facility. And then there's internet media liability. This comes more along the lines of, do you have an internet presence, an online website, and somebody is using and hacking into there? Most importantly, though, the privacy breach coverage for first party is where you're going to incur the majority of your expenses. Data breach expenses in general include legal expenses, forensic expenses, notification, crisis management, and credit monitoring. Out of all of this, I would say that the first two are the most important in the event of a loss. You want to find out why it happened, how to stop it from happening again, and how to contain it right at the outset. There's also covering things like network extortion. That's a ransomware. Digital asset loss. If you have to recreate your data because your data has been encrypted and you cannot get it back. And a business interruption loss, which we noted before is a loss of profits because you cannot operate due to a cyber breach. Now your coverage options as a, um, as any type of, uh, a, a yeah, pardon me, um, as any type of um, uh, purchaser in the marketplace, you could have a standalone cyber policy or you could have extensions under your existing commercial policies. Um, standalone policies are positive things because they give you breach coach guidance from the outset. There are also extensions under operating commercial policies. Um, however, quite often those are based on a reimbursement basis which means you may not have the opportunity to have a dedicated breach coach right away to help you through these types of losses. The OAO currently has two standalone, uh, two options as part of their program. First of all, last year, the OAO Professional Liability Program expanded 
to include um, some uh, cyber coverage through Berkeley Canada. The coverage is limited for first party costs and the limit of insurance is for first party and third party. The standalone cyber coverage is with Access Canada. These are the options that you can currently choose as part of your renewal when you're going through online, which is a minor plug that your insurance is up for renewal. Please look for your emails and renew via the online program. And you can choose to purchase a uh, two different levels of coverage. And I'll go into that a little bit more um, in, in detail as we're moving forward. The limits with the Berkeley program are um, uh, 50,000 in first party coverage and 50,000 in third party coverage. The premium is included in the renewal rating and there is no deductible. Any coverage is good. However, we always like to highlight where the limitations are. And in this area, we would like to note that the, we are only providing first party costs associated with data breach expenses. What that means is there's no coverage for business interruption. There's also no coverage for any losses associated with ransomware. This coverage is also based on a reimbursement basis. Keeping here means that the member is responsible for addressing the breach. You're responsible for finding your own breach coach, your own lawyer. Collect all those costs and then submit them for reimbursement. A standalone cyber policy um, is uh, done with Access, which is an A-rated leading cyber insurance provider. It provides coverage for first and third party coverage. And the first party coverage includes exposures for data breach expenses, as well as business interruption, data recovery, and ransomware is included. So now we're going into um, what, an, what the uh, Access insurance, this is a, just a small chart as to what type of the additional coverage is available under the um, professional liability through access. This is the additional cost. You have an option for purchasing a hundred thousand limit or a million dollar limit. What you have there is you have some exposures and it's outlined there as to what we would pay for exposures for data breach coverage, for ransomware, for business interruption, and for a deductible for first and third party claims. And then finally, the premium. One thing I would like to outline is the fact that currently in the marketplace, um, cyber insurance for medical practitioners of any kind is seen to be a little bit more uh, risky than let's say a manufacturer or a smaller retailer. Usually I see a million dollars in coverage going for about $1,200 to $1,500 in the current marketplace. So the um, uh, terms that are being put forward by Access Canada are extremely competitive. I often have people say, well, I'm not sure what limit I should be purchasing and, and I'm, I'm quite small. I don't think I need to be purchasing any type of cyber coverage. So our key thing here to outline today is the OAO program and their professional liability insurance, the coverage that's provided by Berkeley is much better than having zero insurance. It does provide some first party costs in the event that you have a loss. However, a prudent uh, clinic operator should consider the uh, potential losses from a business interruption and a data recovery perspective in the event of a loss. And at $243 a year, having some broader coverage in that area can be um, and is something that we recommend uh, ODs consider. I will now share the questions that you have submitted. So the first question, what is the proper way to destroy old devices like hard drives that have personal health information on them when they're obsolete or no longer needed? assuming that they're backed up, that copies are kept for the required number of years. So I don't know which of you wants to talk about that. The Information Privacy Commissioner um, has some um, excellent um, guidance documents and fact sheets, including 
um, how to securely destroy uh, different types of personal health information. Um, so uh, reference um, that, um, that would be a good place to go um, in order to do it. Um, and, um, or you can certainly use a third party provider to ensure um, that it actually is being done in a secure way. Thank you, Catherine. We have another question here. What are the penalties to the criminals um, affecting cyber privacy attacks? Do authorities even care enough to prosecute? I, I do know that um, it is a topic of concern with, um, are they just able to come in and, and take over? Um, or are they just being, are they making money hand over this? Uh, the, the, the authorities are involved. They do get involved and they want to get involved at all crimes, at all levels. Unfortunately, at this case, it's not all, they're not just not able to be everywhere at once. Um, we do know that, especially when a ransom is involved, quite often there is um, uh, involvement or when there's a large crime, let's say a large fishing incident, where a company would lose a significant amount of money, then you do see a little bit more involvement. Um, while we know that uh, the authorities would like to be involved at all levels, uh, they're just unfortunately not able to do so, uh, which is why I think it's key for um, uh, ODs to uh, make sure that they are managing some of their own risk internally as well, so that they aren't surprised when some of this happens and they're just not able to have the, uh, the authorities come in and assist them as quickly let's say, as they would like to. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the uh, law enforcement um, agencies have cyber crime uh, divisions now that are very interested in looking at, um, in particular, ransomware attacks and um, getting information to analyze um, how to help prevent those types of incidents from happening. Um, there is uh, a lot of... Um, <coughs> multi-jurisdictional um, cooperation that's uh, often required because they're not necessarily in Canada. Um, but it's certainly a, um, there are, uh, there's some dedicated efforts to try to uh, improve how we respond to this situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's another question here. I have a business partner. I purchased the cyber insurance rider from Hub. Does this cover the whole office? The uh, policy is going to respond to the named insured on the policy itself. So if you have your professional liability through your own, your own operation or your own entity and your own personal name, it will cover you. However, if you do not um, have your other partner's name on there, then it would not. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to uh, Hub via OAO <coughs> at hubinternational.com and we can guide you further as to options uh, to be able to put uh, together for a, uh, an individual business. At times it may make more sense to put one standalone policy instead of multiple practice um, partners purchasing their own. And there's one more question here. In the event of a cyber attack, who do we speak to to help us through the process? So if we're talking about um, if you purchase cyber insurance, um, your insurance certificate specifically references in the event of a breach, mm -hmm. there's phone numbers directly that you can call. Um, they will connect you directly to a breach coach. Now, that is if you have purchased the additional cyber coverage via Access Canada. As a reminder, your standalone coverage that's included as part of your professional liability is on a reimbursement basis. What that means is you would be responsible for your own. That means you could absolutely go out and contact a breach coach. Uh, Catherine's presentation made some reference to having a plan in place. A good portion of that plan to be, have you done some research to know who you would want to call? Right now, we know that many breach consultants are very busy with insur insured Cases. In other words, they have contracts with insurance companies. So if you're going through and picking a breach coach, you may want to go through, go past just Googling or going on the yellow pages, calling them up, having a conversation, uh, having that type of dialogue with them to know, if I had a breach, would I be 17th on the list because you're dealing with a number of other things, or would I be able to have a relationship with you? 
OAO members can um, also contact the Miller Thompson on call hotline um, and we can uh, certainly get you started um, and put you in touch with, um, with resources as well. Great, thank you so much. Looks like we're almost out of time and that's the last question we've got online. So at this time, I would like to thank Catherine and Kim for your presentation. And I'd like to thank Miller Thompson and Hub for partnering with OAO for tonight's webinar. The webinar will be posted on the OAO website within the next few weeks. Please complete our survey as you log off. Thank you for joining us. Good night all.